All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is Rob talking to you via my cell phone, uh, making a video for you guys. You may recognize this uh, photo. We worked on this in class. Um, I know I got a couple of classes, so you may have not recognized it, but you remember, hopefully, the technique that I taught in class on how to stain a certain type of watercolor paper and getting these uh, types of effects and different types of effects. I went with a more um, wackier sort of uh, abstract kind of background, okay? And so what I'm hoping to do here is talk a little bit about the drawing that I already started with uh, my students in class. I wanted to finish it for you guys on this video and cover uh, certain points that I find important. Um, and another future video I hope to do is actually explain how I stain this actual paper to begin with. So there's no mystery to it. You know, how do I get here to begin with? I'll explain that in other videos. Um, the, the actual drawing process I'm gonna go into in other videos in the future. But uh, this video was basically uh, for anybody, but basically so I can kind of finish this whole uh, season uh, in as high a note as possible. With this whole coronavirus thing, uh, we weren't able to finish the last few classes that we had left, and I felt like I kind of left everybody hanging. So we're going to dive right into this. So I'm just going to talk real quick how I got this and where you should be uh, checking yourself and at what point, okay? You, you should always be checking yourself when you're drawing. Drawing is something that is not just done. You need to be checking as you go, am I doing it the right way? Is, and by the right way, I mean, is it proportionate? In portraiture, proportions are gonna be the most important thing, making sure that different parts of the face are proportionate to other parts. And all that means, basically, is if you look at the face, and we'll look at the, um, the photo here, let me take this off. This is just some photo I found online. Okay, you can use your own family, some line, online photo. Uh, use whatever you want. So given her size, not the size that printed out, but the size if she were alive right in front of me, the size of her head, the size of her forehead compared to the overall size of the head, for example, the size of the, uh, the center third, as it's called, from the top of the eyebrow to the bottom of the nose, that piece of your face compared to the whole head. What, what is that, right? That's proportions. That's what we're trying to do as artists. And it doesn't matter if you're drawing a, a person, place, or thing. It's simply, I need to know how big this part of the subject is compared to another part of it, okay? So we started with the top being the top of her head right up here, and then the bottom of her chin, okay? So that's the whole size. Okay, I'm gonna just go zip through this. I know it's gonna be too fast for you to understand if you've never taken my class. Again, this is geared more for my students that already had started this project in class and kind of helped them along. Um, and again, I'm gonna start doing more videos in the future and explain in greater detail how I even got this far. So if you're one of my students, you're watching this, if you got to this point, you should be checking yourself at this point. What do I do now? That is basically what you're asking yourself. Well, before you continue drawing eyes, nose, and mouth, just look at those big proportions, okay? And so let's just take a look at her face, and let's look at the top third. The face is different than the head. So when I say facial uh, thirds, uh, I'm not talking about the entire head, which would be the top of her hair to the bottom of her chin. The face is the hairline, okay, where your hair, the uh, forehead starts down to the chin, so your face. In your facial thirds, you have the forehead area, which is basically your hairline to the top of your eyebrows. Then the center third would be your top of your eyebrows to the bottom of your nose. And the bottom third would be the bottom of the nose to the chin. Really simple, right? One, two, three pieces. When I look at those three pieces, before I continue on my drawing, I wanna make sure that on my drawing, I have the same proportions that I'm seeing in this subject. So I'm just gonna compare real quick the top third or the forehead because it looks similar in size to the bottom third, I'm gonna compare it. 
by measuring it, you see what I'm doing there? I'm putting my fingernail to the tip of my pencil, and then I'm gonna compare that down to the chin to nose area. And just as I suspected, they're pretty much the same darn thing. There's not much of a difference, okay? And so that tells me that her forehead is the same, or her top third, is the same as her bottom third. So whatever size drawing I have here on my paper, the forehead needs to be the same size as the bottom third, okay? So from nose to chin, it needs to be the same size, okay, as the hairline to the eyebrow. When you look at the photograph here, you'll notice that the center third is much larger just by looking at it. You don't even need to measure it. You just know it's just much larger than either the forehead or the bottom third, okay? Your ability to, de to determine the difference in size, how much bigger is it, right? Let's just say 20% bigger. Now, what does that mean to you as an artist? That can become very scientific, very mathematical, and I don't use math or science or anything like that. I'm simply just using that as an explanation as to the amount that I perceive to have that piece bigger, okay? The amount that I think it's bigger. I'm saying it's about 20% bigger, whatever that means to you. Okay, it's a little bit bigger. So I look at this big piece in the middle and I compare it to the top and to the bottom and it is quite a bit bigger, okay? It's about, I don't know, 30% bigger or so. So I'm looking at my centerpiece and making sure that it's proportionally speaking bigger than the forehead and the nose to chin, okay? So again, we're gonna go into much greater detail in the future about how to get to that point. But for right now, I'm just gonna finish her off. I wanna just talk about some of the details that I did here and how I got to where I got. So the eyes are usually the faces about five eyes across. The width of your eye from left to right, it takes about five of those across. But that's, that's just an artist sort of uh, measurement. In reality, it's it's actually less than five eyes. It's actually your two eyes, the center space in between your eyes, which is exactly the space of one eye in most cases, making it three. So one, two, three. And then the space on either side of our eye is usually about three quarters of an eye or so, but it depends on the person's angle. If they're turned a little bit away from us um, or if they're looking right at us, okay? So in this photo here, I see that she has about almost an eye on the, her left side over here and about half an eye on her right side over here. And so I did what I feel those spaces should be. And again, I'll go into greater detail in the future. This is where I determined the bottom of the eyebrows. So I'm just now going to start going into drawing some of the eyebrows. As I'm doing this drawing, I'm making sure my pressure is very, very light. I don't want to apply an enormous amount of pressure at this time. Actually, I never want to apply an, enorm an enormous amount of pressure ever. I never want to press so hard that I'm making little miniature Grand Canyons all across my paper. In other words, I'm carving my lines into it because what happens is if you were wrong and you go to erase that, it's simply not gonna come off. It's pretty much there for life. It'll, even if it, most of the black comes off, you're going to have these little gray, annoying images or, or lines that you just, you'll never get rid of. So, always draw with light pressure. Notice I, I hold my pencil like so, okay? Holding my pencil like this lets me draw very, very lightly. And I'm using General's... Uh, Charcoal pencil, it's all faded now, but it's, all, it's an old pencil, but it's General's brand uh, charcoal pencils. You can get a kit at Michael's or wherever you like to go shop. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. I'm probably not gonna worry too much about making this drawing look exactly like her, because I just wanna finish what I'm doing, because eventually, you see all these dots from the splattering of paint for the whole, uh, abstract background that I was going for, that's gonna show through. There's really no way of covering that up uh, just using charcoal. So what I wanna do now is give myself a 
a pretty detailed drawing that I'm gonna spray fix. I'm gonna be going that into this in this video. Um, I want to spray fix it so it will hold my lines and they won't smudge when I then paint some light gray into it. And I'm using acrylic that's watered down, okay? And that's gonna start to gray up the areas that I want covered in charcoal. And that way I'll hide all these orangey, yellowy, just smudgy nightmare smudges and, and droplets or what have you. So I just need this to be dark enough for me to see through the actual paint. And that's really, that's all I'm trying to do right now. I don't really care about it being uh, shaded. I don't want to try to worry about shading or highlights or any of that stuff. I just want a line drawing that is as accurate as I want it to be. And this is her iris. And again, you know, as, as you sit at home watching this, take your time, do your drawing slowly like the way I teach in class. Make sure you are very, very careful with what you're doing. I'm being very uh, cavalier in my structure. I'm just kinda, just try to get accurate but not really worried about it too much. So I just wanna kinda just get this drawing done. Doesn't matter if it looks like her um, right now because this is not gonna be, this isn't a commission, it's, it's just fun, it's just practice. And it's really about getting to the point where I can show you guys how I cover up the actual skin um, so you can't see all these dots. That's really, that's, that's what the purpose of this video is. And so keep that in mind. I don't have any cute music for the background like they do on all those uh, professional videos. Because again, I'm literally learning how to do videos as I, as I go. This is my very first video. I hope I don't mess this up too much. And another thing I wanna talk about is comfort. I am not very physically comfortable right now where I'm sitting. You know, when you're at home, be comfortable. Sit where you can comfortably reach your, your paper. I'm trying my best to stay away uh, from the paper so you guys can see what I'm doing, but I'm having a hard time really grasping the right angle of things because I'm, I'm kind of seeing things from the side. So this iris needs to definitely move over quite a bit. Here's another great tool, a little, uh, I call it a click eraser. Generals makes this also, okay? And it's a nice hard white eraser. Don't make this your go-to eraser. This should not be your go-to eraser, okay? Your go-to eraser should be your needed eraser. As you can see, I put mine to a point, but you don't wanna use the clicky eraser, okay? I sharpen mine to a point for all your erasing. I just needed to go into a little tiny area and I found it easier to use that. And the reason is this is, this is very, it's a very hard, strong eraser and could damage your paper. And so if you erase a lot, as a lot of my students tend to do, you're just gonna run into a lot more problems. Okay, you're gonna start damaging your surface. So always go for your kneaded eraser first, your little click erasers just for those little tight areas. The width of the eyes, once I had gotten all that in and the, uh, and the height and all that, we're gonna go into a lot of those details and I plan to have some eye demos and nose demos and all that sort of fun stuff just to show you how I got to this point to begin with.
So here's a here's an opportunity to go into just some minor uh, alignment, so you can see how things are aligned with each other. Um, I look at the mouth line where the two lips meet, right here, and it, she's got this nice little right where the lips meet. The bottom of her upper lip it kind of sweeps upward like this, like a uh, like a happy face, right? Where is those two points? Where are those two points of the happy face, the high points, right? I can go like this, drop a line on my photo like so, and it goes right up into the center of her nostrils. And so rough, roughly in there. So that kind of helps me to figure out the whole drawing as I'm working. I, I, I'm not just guessing at how big that curve is. I'm not guessing at how wide something is. I'm using my, my uh, facial features, the nose, the edge of the nose, the, the, the nostrils, the center of something, so I can align something else to it. And that's how I figure out where things go. And so, I'm gonna do this. And my ultimate goal is to teach you not just how to draw from photographs like I'm using here, okay? Because there's nothing wrong with using photographs. There's people out there that say, oh, you should never use photographs and, and always draw from life and et cetera, et cetera. And that's fantastic. That's, that's a great idea. I, I definitely think if you can draw from life, if the subject matter is available, in this case, a, a human being, if the person is willing to pose for you and all that, that's great. You can go to colleges and... There's art ateliers and, and art centers in every city, and you can, you, know, you can do some research on that. And you'll find places where you'll have models and you pay, usually it's not that much money, you know, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever, and you'll have a live model in front of you. If you have that accessible, that's a great thing to use. I definitely teach with the ultimate purpose being that you can draw from life. But, realistically, most people can't just get up on a Saturday afternoon at three in the afternoon and decide, okay, I suddenly want to draw and pick up the phone and call somebody to come over and pose. And so what do you do? You don't draw? No, that would be ridiculous. Of course you're going to draw or else when are you going to practice? You have technology, use it. There's nothing wrong with using, in this case, photographs to practice because your only other option, if you can't draw from life because you're you're too shy, which is what I usually run into with my students, or you're too, uh, or it's just not in, in, in your area. You can't find something at that hour of the day or on that particular day or whatever. Whatever the issue is, if that's your problem, then what, the only other solution you have is to not draw. And obviously, that's not going to teach you anything. So if you have a, 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 a computer, you can just download some pictures from Google, just type in faces. You want, you know, something with interesting, interesting light, you can type in faces in low light, for example. Okay, and then you'll have all kinds of pictures available for you to practice. Okay, famous people, nobodies, you can take pictures of your own family and then just, you know, email them to yourself or however you want to do it and practice with that. And little by little, you'll start getting better at drawing. Uh, in, in future videos that I hope to do, I will show different ways of treating this whole drawing experience so you can get better at drawing people from pictures but using the same techniques in drawing uh, from life. So that way you're kind of getting an all around training. You can draw from pictures, but the techniques I'll teach you are for people that want to draw um, from life also. And so that's kind of a advantage, I guess, to be able to do both. Because pictures are very, you know, they're very static. A lot of times you can tell when somebody just used a photograph. And again, I got no problem with it, you know. I don't know anybody that likes me enough to want to pose for me. <laughs> Uh, for any amount of time, I, and I got little kids there that they're not going to sit still for me to draw them. I have to take a picture. It's as simple as that. And then I just draw from the picture. 
and drawing from a picture is also going to be much easier. The picture doesn't move. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't need a potty break. It doesn't need anything. It's just, it just sits there. And it lets you uh, draw from it all day long, as long as you want. And it doesn't uh, give you any of those problems. Okay? Now, those problems that I just mentioned are things you're going to need to overcome once you start getting into drawing from life. Okay? But, again, we're going to draw from photographs because... It's just a heck of a lot more efficient use of my time. And it's cheaper. The cost of some ink and paper, that's all this takes. Whereas a model would be quite a bit of money for you to pay somebody to come over and model for you. There's also sometimes they got online uh, groups that you can join. There might be one in your area where you can join and, um, and they share the cost of, of a model. I was part of one years ago, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, again, with this whole coronavirus thing, you can see how drawing from photographs is almost the only option. You'd have to be crazy or extremely irresponsible to be going out with this whole coronavirus thing. So more proof that drawing from pictures is just as good, and not just that, it's a heck of a lot safer than running out there and meeting up in a large group of people, potentially getting you yourself sick or getting others sick. Okay, so I had switched over, just so you know, I switched over to a medium because this paper's kind of dark from the stain and everything that I did, so it was kind of becoming difficult for me to see the lines with the HB hard charcoal that I was using. So I moved over to the medium, which is the next level up, and it's a little darker because I remember I want to see these lines through the paint layer that's going to go over it, okay? So as you can see, it's just, just a simple line drawing. Now what I'm doing is I'm getting rid of all the, uh, the little lines that I use for aligning the eyes and the nose and everything else. All these little uh, lines that were so important in the beginning, I now make them go away. And I just basically I'm doing cleanup, just doing cleanup work. And so you're going to erase anything that you don't want in your drawing. Notice I haven't shaded. Again, for what I'm trying to accomplish today, I don't need to shade. But even if I was drawing, say, on white paper or on regular toned paper that I didn't prepare with this wacky background, let's just say I was doing it on a gray, gray toned paper or tan or something like that, like the Strathmore brand that some of my students get in my class. This is what you wanna have right here. It's just a line drawing. What you don't want is to have a whole bunch of shading going on right now because it's too early in the game. You wanna be able to right now, stay, just basically stare at it and stare at your photo and start looking for any mistakes, anything that you find that like, really stands out at you and says, wow, that, that's really terrible. That, that's really off. I did the nose too big or the forehead or whatever, okay? Whatever it is you find wrong with it. There's no point in shading something that might not be ready to shade, okay? An ugly or let's just say a, a, a bad drawing doesn't look better when you shade it. It's still a bad drawing that got shaded. So don't waste time shading Spend more time trying to fix and adjust your drawing, okay? Maybe the eyes are too big or, or whatever it is, it is that you see, this is the time to start doing it. Now, something that I see is her neck. Let me darken it, even though I'm going to end up having to erase some of it. Look at this neck right here. It dips as far back as that right there, okay? I'm going to put my stick up in case you can't see it. So the neck starts here, and then it curves in and then goes right to where my stick is. Look at this stick. This stick is what, I mean, it's a little barbecue skewer. It's called a vertical plumb line, okay? And then a horizontal plumb line is that. That is the best tool you can have right there is a plumb line, okay? Plumb lines are your best friend. When you go use your plumb lines, you're trying to basically see what falls on that stick. 
Now, I think that just looking at my drawing, I think it's too, too far that way, the curve. It's too far this way. So then look at my stick. I hold it up straight, and it's running pretty much touching, almost touching the, uh, the left tear duct. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to check the curve on the, flo the photograph. And so I put it to the far extent, same area, and I notice that it goes and cuts the face in half. So really, I should put my stick in the middle like so. And that's how far back that curve has to go. So I don't know that you can see that. I'm having a hard time figuring out videos, but basically that's how far back that curve goes. In other words, I curved way too much. It comes, it's a gentler, softer curve. And so I'm gonna just fix that now. And then I go to my handy dandy go-to eraser, which is always my needed eraser. And now that looks much, much better. It looks more human-esque, okay? It looks more correct instead of looking incorrect, okay? Let me move my camera just a little bit. I, I feel like maybe you can't see this properly, but I promise I'll try to figure out this whole video thing in the future and hopefully you can get something else out of this. So again, the little swooping back right here of the neck, it comes back as far as the center of her face. So my neck needs to come back as far as the center of my face. And now it does. And so I'm much more accurate to what I'm seeing in the photograph. The shoulder needs to come down just a little bit. And again, I'm in the future, I'm gonna do more videos and I'll talk more about how I got, you know, the shoulders in and the height of them and all that fun stuff in the future because I just don't have time on this video. I just wanna get this done and, and get this out to my students as soon as I can. So here's that collarbone, and then the ear sticks out just a tad, a little tiny bit. It comes out to about there, and I'm, I'm moving over again to this medium because it's darker so I can see my line drawing, but in reality, or in, I should say in reality, in most cases, I don't use anything but HB hard because I find a medium to be just too dark for the other type of paper that I usually use. I usually like, by the way, Canson uh, Mi Dientes, I believe I'm pronouncing that right, uh, line of paper. It's a pastel paper. That's the kind of paper I like. It's probably the most inexpensive pastel paper of high quality that's out there. So I highly recommend using them. They have other brands that are just as good, but you're gonna pay a heck of a lot more. Notice right now I'm just trying to align my ear to the other ear so it's in the same spot roughly so they look roughly level. This ear you can't really see it. There's a bunch of hair going out there so you can't really see that. Um, I'm now looking at her right eye and her right eye, she almost looks like she has a little bit of a lazy eye on her left eye originally so I moved that iris and now my right eye looks like there's just not enough white on the outside edge of it. So I'm gonna move the iris. So you see how many little changes I'm doing even on a quickie drawing like this that, that is quite meaningless to me. It's not a, a, yeah, I'm not gonna put this at a show or anything like that. This is just something playing around to show you guys. But you can see how I'm being very, and that's habit. That's just a, a, a really good habit to build up over the years, you wanna make sure that you build up good habits like checking yourself. I always like to use the state of Pennsylvania. I've never been to Pennsylvania to my knowledge that I know of, but what I mean by Pennsylvania is the initials for Pennsylvania are PA, okay, PA. So the first letter being proportions and A standing for angles. So. When I tell my students, you need to Pennsylvania this thing, they always giggle and they always, but you know, they understand that I mean basically, double check yourself. 
That means go into this thing and start looking at it before you shade, before you start drawing in heavy lines and, and saying, yep, that's for sure where the eye goes or whatever, and doing these, these big investments in time because it takes you time to shade and all that just to find out an hour or two later that, wow, I screwed that up big. It's way, it's way too small or I needed to do this or I needed to move that or whatever your issue is, okay? You wanna check your proportions like I spoke about earlier. And you wanna check your angles, make sure that things are aligned, like the neck thing that I just talked about right now, how far in that goes, um, what the mouth aligns to, what the outside of the nostrils align to, um, the inside of the eyebrows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do things align to, okay? So alignment and angles, that's what the A stands for, okay? So Pennsylvania, this thing, when you hear me say that, it simply means proportions and angles, okay? You're just trying to make sure that, hey, this is a little bit, the ears are just a hair bit above the eyebrows, like they are here in this photograph. Just barely touch them. And in my drawing, I see that, so I know it's right. And that's basically what I'm trying to do is essentially prove to myself that all my decisions up to now are correct. That's essentially what you're trying to do. I said it was this big or that wide or what have you, and now I'm trying to basically prove it to myself. So I use PA, uh, proportions and angles. And I just do that throughout. And it's time consuming, okay? Like anything else you create by hand, it's time consuming. I always tell my students, you're gonna be there a while. If you are the button pushing type and you don't function in any other way except pressing a button and having things automatically done for you, then you're probably in the wrong hobby. This is hard work. It's as simple as that. It's hard work. You have to basically put in the time. You have to invest that time to practice. All the classes in the world aren't going to help you if you don't practice all these techniques. Now, what I do is teach students a bunch of information that would otherwise take you many, many years trying to figure it out on your own. So basically what I'm doing is saving you years or, or, or decades, if anything, of time trying to figure out what the heck am I supposed to be doing. Maybe you never figure it out. You just live the rest of your life drawing really bad drawings. I don't know. Um, and that's any class. That's, that's, not, that's not me. That's what, you, uh, what most instructors, I believe, are trying to do. They're trying to save you time. So really what you're paying for when you pay for a class um, at your local art center or a video or what have you, is you're paying for that time that it would otherwise take you to figure it out on your own. You're paying for that time to kind of shrink down from decades to maybe years or years to maybe months or what have you. Everybody learns at a, a different pace. So don't be frustrated. Don't get, you know, don't get mad at yourself because, you know, it didn't come out good. I always tell my students, look, if this is your first time really getting into this, you're probably going to make some really crappy drawings, right? You're going to produce garbage. And I, I know that doesn't sound nice, but think about it. Everything you do for the very first time, I don't care if uh, you, you, my other hobby is going out shooting, for example. I love, I love going out with my kids and taking them shooting and all that. You don't pick up a gun and just start shooting and hitting the target. Somebody needs to show you how to use a gun, right? Or if you're going to paint, somebody needs to show you what kind of brush and what type of brush. you got to learn all these different products, uh, uh, items, you know, brushes and types of paints and all this stuff about painting and, and all that. And speaking about painting, I might be doing a painting video for my oil painting students uh, that are out there. So I can talk a little bit about painting. I do workshops on that and they're always a pretty big hit because I tend to simplify a lot of really complex ideas um, and I teach it in my very simplified manner, okay? So essentially right now I'm looking for mistakes. I'm not darkening by pressing harder Okay, I don't want you to make that mistake. I'm not darkening by pressing harder. I simply moved up to a medium, which is already naturally harder than the uh, HB hard. I, I'm sorry, it's naturally darker than the HB hard I was using prior. 
And that's all that is doing for me is giving me a much darker line for me to follow. Because again, remember, we're going to paint over her face with gray paint. If the lines, the lines are too light, you're not going to see that. You're not going to see your drawing. And you just wasted a lot of time. So they need to be a little bit darker. Never press hard for any reason. I've never found any reason when I'm drawing to press hard. There's never a reason to press hard. Ever. People assume, well, I want a darker line. And so their first natural instinct is they grab that pencil and they just jam it in there and they start uh, scraping around. And it's just, they're, they're destroying the surface of their paper. They make lines that they can't erase because they find out later they made a mistake. So you don't want to be that person. You don't want to draw heavily, okay? By drawing lighter, it's a much more, uh, it's a safer way of drawing because you can then move your information around, move all this stuff around. Oh, I didn't like that. Hey, no big deal. I can move that over here. I can move that over there. And so it's not a big, big deal for you to get rid of stuff. Whereas somebody who presses hard, you know, they're pretty much saying right off the get-go, they're saying, you know what? That's 100% correct. That is some serious confidence. If you are that confident that your very first line, you can just go whoop and say, wow, I press really hard and say, I am that good that I know this is 100% correct. Hey, you're, you're a better man than I am. I mean, that is incredible if you can do that. But of course, <coughs> none of us are robots. None of us are perfect. We make mistakes. <coughs> Sorry about all the coughing. I'm actually, <coughs> I'm not sick. I don't have coronavirus or anything, but my kid, I'm, I'm near my kitchen and my daughter decided to uh, not tell me that she was going to microwave something. And now it's, she burnt something and she, she was trying to deny it about an hour ago. And coming out of my bedroom to make this video, I said, okay, my house is on fire. What the hell is going on? And my daughter has that face, like all 11 year olds, like you caught them doing something. And some, some sort of macaroni adventure was going on in her head and, and now it smells like smoke in my house and now I'm, now I'm coughing. So I apologize for all the coughing. For my students, if you see my youngest daughter in the future, you can ridicule her and make her feel bad for burning macaroni and cheese and making her daddy cough during a video. Okay. I know I said not to shade too much. Um, all I did here was just add a little value. I'm trying to make sure because this, the, the shape of your shadows, like I'm looking in her eye and along her nose, along her cheek, the shape of a shadow helps you to determine proportions and to make sure that things are aligned correctly. So I don't mind the little shading because I looked at my drawing and for right now, I like what I see, even though I know I'm not 100% satisfied with it because again, I'm drawing this really fast just to get it done. And I know it's not the most accurate drawing. If you're one of my students, you're thinking, well, I've seen him do better than that. And you're right. But this is about getting the job done so I can move on to the next step. And so now I'm basically, you can't see me, but I'm leaning back <coughs> uh, in my chair and I'm just looking at it, trying to get some distance between the picture and myself, okay? I don't have the space to get up and walk back a good six to 10 feet like I normally like to do. Um, so I'm just leaning back, I'm about three feet away from it. And the reason you do that, okay, and it's better, again, you want to get up and walk away uh, or walk back. And the reason you want to do that is so you can take in the whole drawing with the photograph from a distance. And you can much easily tell that you made a big mistake over here, over there, whatever. You made a mistake somewhere, okay? Some artists will get a mirror and uh, put a, bit, a large mirror behind them. And then they hold like a little handheld mirror and that way they can see themselves. They don't have to get up to laser way of doing things. And you look in the little handheld mirror, you see the mirror behind you reflecting the picture. And it's kind of the same thing as moving back out of your chair. I prefer to get up. I, I, I don't like using the mirror thing. Nothing wrong with it. It's just not my thing. Um, 
and it's good exercise. It, you know, sitting at your easel for hours and hours and hours is not a good idea. And so there's tons that I would love to change, but I'm not going to waste more time with that. I'm just going to do a little bit more stuff, and I'm, I think I'm going to call it quits for now and be done with the drawing of it. I'm going to come down here, and there's some lines for where the shoulder was and stuff like that. And I'm not worried too much about the shoulder and, and chest area. I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to do it just probably a little bit beyond the neck. Probably a little bit of this shoulder, a little bit of the top of this shoulder. And I'm going to be calling it a, a done picture with that. I'm not going to go any more detail than that. I hope everybody out there is healthy and practicing some uh, safe distancing and all that fun stuff. Uh, if you wanted to, you could actually darken in the hair at this point, okay? Um, putting in charcoal and, and, and doing that, because that's going to basically, as you can see, it's just black hair. That's going to be very, very dark, and so you could do that. So I'm going to show you just what that would look like. You can do that now. You can do it later. I think I'm going to do some of that now because I kind of want to be as far into this as I can. I'm moving over to my little piece of black charcoal. Mine is very small because it's broken off, but basically it's a little black charcoal piece that comes in one of those um, general brand charcoal kits. Okay, most of my students, if not all of them, have this. <clears throat> and basically it's just a, it's basically, it's charcoal, but it's just a, big old piece like using a large brush to cover <clears throat> to cover up an area why would you use a little brush right so it's just common sense and now i'm going to do around the cheek there and the ear and i'm just trying to give it some some value there some tone just make sure this thing gets nice and dark You can see it's just a big, large brush, essentially. And it's kind of small, so I'm gonna pick up a larger one. <clears throat> I got in these little baggies. Here's a little, a little tip. The little bags, the little Ziploc bags, the little small ones. You see how tiny that is? These are great for holding my erasers. So I got one for my erasers, so they don't get uh, dirty inside my box. And of course, I got another one for my really dark black charcoal pieces. These uh, almost look like pastel. In fact, you could use black pastel. There wouldn't be any problem with that. And this is really soft charcoal right here. And you can see how this just does all that hair. If I had to do this with my pencil, you can see how with my pencil, this would take an enormous amount of time. I, I would be here for a very, very long time. So. It's just a more efficient way of working. Now, I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna pick up my little chamois, and I'm just gonna blend that out. I never let my black, soft black charcoal just sit on the surface. The reason is, if I were to just leave this like that, that's, that's not really in the paper, it's not penetrating the pores of the paper. What ends up happening is this, would just be a mess. It would be like wet paint that never dries and it, 
anything that comes along and, and touches it, it's going to smudge it and you're going to have wet paint everywhere. So for that reason, I always, always smudge it, I guess you would say, or blend it in. Here in this case, I'm using my, my little chamois. And then I think in terms of layers, not getting it done in one shot. This isn't like paint where you can just grab some black paint and, and slap it on there. In charcoal, it's, it's a little bit more work. And I think in terms of layers. And I'm going to go into using alcohol, okay, rubbing alcohol, so I can darken and basically stain the surface with black charcoal, okay? But I can, I'm looking back on the video as I'm working and I'm looking at the screen and it's looking already pretty dark. So you can already see there's a difference already. So even if I left it like that, it's, it's not bad. I don't like this eye at all. It looks like she's got, like she's winking or something. I don't know, it doesn't look right. So that would be something that if this was something that I really cared about, I would be fixing that eye and making sure that it, um, it looks the way I want it to look, okay? I just use my pinky. Don't, don't use your fingers. Anything that's a dry material, okay? I just need a little tiny spot. But really, I don't like to use my fingers, and I tell my students, don't, don't finger your drawings, okay? Don't do that. It looks really amateur. It just looks just terrible. It looks really bad. And people get addicted to that for some reason, and, and they, they start fingering the thing all over the place. They, the next thing you know, it's just, just a big mess of fingerprints all over this thing. It just doesn't look good. So don't, don't use your fingers with charcoal, graphite, um, whatever, okay? The only time I do like using my fingers to blend, um, and it's the only dry material that I'll actually say, yeah, go ahead and knock yourself out, is pastel. And the reason is it's easier with pastel to use my fingers because pastels are even softer than charcoal. And what ends up happening is a lot of that pastel will come off the paper if you were to use a brush like I'm about to here or a stump or anything else. And so for that reason, I don't like using um, tools when it comes to pastel. They simply don't work. But with charcoal, which is a different material, they do work. Tools are your best friends, okay? This is, this is my, I use my tools, you know, brush, my eraser, my blending stump, whatever I need, I grab, and that's what I use for charcoal. I don't use my fingers because I don't want the oil and all that stuff to stick to my paper because then it, it could ruin a drawing. So for that reason, I highly recommend not using your fingers at all when you are using charcoal. Or graphite. Graphite, for those of you that don't know, is basically a number two pencil that you all flunked your test with in school, okay? And if you're an artist, you probably flunked a lot of tests in school, right? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, it's kind of funny. And so, right now, I'm just applying a little value into the face. Again, I'm going to be painting into this, so I don't need tons of information. Just enough so I can get through it. I'm gonna do this little dip right here. Notice I haven't used my white charcoal yet, okay? I'm not using that now because I'm gonna save that for the end. Right now, it, it wouldn't stick very well. It really wouldn't do much for me, so it would just be a lot of wasted time. forehead sometimes just another tip when it comes to past or excuse me to um, doing portraits okay in portraiture it's important that it looks like the person and that is very daunting very scary for some people and then they either give up or they don't even try so what I like to tell my students is because I'd rather have you keep trying and stick with it than to just give up so that's not gonna you know that's not gonna do anything for anyone 
So I tell them to use, uh, I use an acronym, okay? I use a lot of acronyms. Uh, and the acronym I use is RAG, race, age, gender, okay? So the race, the age, and the gender of whoever it is in your photograph, okay? So I see in my photograph a white, young female. That's it. It isn't any more complicated than that. So all I want to present in my drawing is a white, young female. RAG, race, age, gender. That's what I see here. Therefore, that's what I want to worry about here. If you worry too much about it's got to look like Uncle Bob or whoever it is you're drawing, what ends up happening is a lot of times you fail at that when you first start out. And it doesn't look, it, it might not even <laughs> look human. And what ends up happening is you get, you know, you kind of get down about it and, and you, you end up quitting. And that's not good. I don't want you to quit. I want you to keep trying. So I tell people, just worry about getting the race, the age, and the gender correct. Okay, so RAG. If you just get that correct, to me it's a success. It's something to say, yeah, I did good. Okay, can it be better? Sure, of course, we can all improve. We can all improve. I can improve. We can all improve. There's always room to grow. But that being said, you want to make sure that you don't overstress yourself. Okay, this is supposed to be fun. Most people watching this are probably hobbyists. They probably, you know, you, you, you're like me, you know, you just do this for fun. Um, you know, I teach on the side and stuff like that, but you're, you're probably a hobbyist and you want to make this fun, right? That's what a hobby is. If it's not fun, then what the heck's the point, right? Why, why do it? And so try to keep the stress level down. And the number one thing that I think causes stress in portraiture is, oh my God, it doesn't look like whoever. And then that just leads you to just want to give up. Instead, worry about just getting it to look like the race, the age, and the gender. And then you worry about it having it look like Uncle Bob or Aunt Susie or whoever later on. As you learn the techniques, hopefully I can make more videos in the future about different techniques and you start learning how to actually get the likeness, you'll get better and better and better. And then before you know it, at least in my classes here in South Florida, um, I've had a lot of students that I've taken in that, you know, they have little to no art experience at all. Retired doctors and accountants and everything else that, that you would could possibly imagine that has nothing to do with art. And they just had a passion for not really for drawing or for art, but they had it as a passion for learning. And they had an open mind and they were willing to go in there and listen and do what I was instructing them to do, whatever, the, whatever they're into, whatever instructor uh, yeah, I was telling them to do, which seems obvious, but you'd be amazed how many people fail because they go in there with their own preconceived notions of what they're supposed to do. And they become a little close-minded, a little argumentative, and they spend 12 weeks and a few hundred bucks not really learning how to do anything except how to argue. So if you want to get better at this, remember RAG, okay? Remember RAG, race, age, gender. Take it easy. Give whoever it is that's teaching you in that particular class, whatever it is you're learning, a chance to explain themselves and to follow what they're saying, okay? A lot of the stuff that I'm saying here has been said for centuries, okay? I have my own take on it, okay? I do comparative measurements, and I'm going to go into that in the future. But it's basically, though, the, the same information that's been out there for, for centuries. You know, who knows how long this stuff, because it's, it's not, not brand new concepts that I invented. And every time I think I came up with something new, I'm always disappointed, and I read in a book somewhere how some guy by the name of Da Vinci or Michelangelo or somebody, I've been doing that forever. And I'm like, I get disappointed because I thought I came up with it. And it turns out that's been done. But that's good, because if anything, it reinforces what I'm supposed to be doing, at least if you believe that these guys hundreds of years ago were doing it correctly. And so now I just can't help myself but to make it more right. So I'm kind of cleaning it up, even though I know I said I was just doing a... Uh, a quickie kind of thing and I just wanted to finish up the drawing that you guys saw when I first sat down
Now you see this edge over here. I'm going to talk for a second just about edges. The edge over here that I got, it's kind of broken, more or a soft edge, okay? It's actually incorrect because the edge on the drawing on her right cheek, it's actually a hard edge, okay? Very crisp, hard edge. And so for that reason, I'm going to clean that up just to make sure when I go into this with uh, paint that I have an edge that is correct and that makes sense. Move my photograph over because it's casting a shadow on my drawing. And you know, that's not too shabby for being kind of a quickie thing. Not too shabby at all. It, I feel like it needs more work into the jaw area and the cheek, but whatever. cheek area or this chin area needs to be fixed because it's just not right. And now something else I like to do sometimes even when I'm not doing it with the paint thing I'm going to show you. Sometimes I'll do this and I'll let that charcoal kind of blend in. If anything it's going to help to hide all those splatters and stuff in the background and soften those lines just a little bit and then I could work on top of that I'm just going to reinforce some of the more important parts eyes nostrils Lips. I think that's good enough for government work. So now what the next step is, I'm going to spray fix this with vinyl fixative. Okay. And once the fixative sets, I'm gonna do one layer, and then I'll just take my, uh, my clean pinky, right now they're all dirty, and I'm gonna go like that, make sure that nothing's coming up. Um, usually one layer, maybe a second spray will cover it, just so it, the, the picture doesn't move, because then I'm gonna get some acrylic gray, okay, uh, acrylic paint, and water it down significantly. I'm gonna water it down, so I'm gonna paint into all of the um, the facial features all the way down to like the shoulder area, okay? The hair is going to be black, so I don't need to paint that gray. But if you get into some of the hair, that's not a big deal. And so by fixing it, the paint won't smudge with all this charcoal, okay? If you don't fix it, what can happen is that a lot of that loose charcoal could mix into your paint and darken areas and give it a smudgy look. Uh, and uh, you, you know, it could cause you problems. So save yourself a lot of headaches and just use some spray fixative first. And then we're going to go into painting. So uh, in the next segment, we'll talk about that.